Alrighty peoples, this is Ross. So I'm pretty excited for today's video. I hope that if you're watching right now, um, whether you guys are new or old to my channel, that you will hopefully stick through to the end of this video. Um, we're gonna have a pretty fun, inspiring, uh, hopefully an educational little glimpse into my seed starting. We are officially, after much deliberation, really starting my season right now. Today is February 23rd of 2021. And uh, I'm really excited. I really am because, uh, you know, it's been a long winter with COVID. It's been a long winter in general. Um, the last, I want to say the last month and a half, maybe even two months, has been relatively quite cold. Uh, there hasn't been many days above 40, which really, really hurts even more because COVID is you know, a time where you really need to go outside and, and do things. And it's been quite difficult, I think, to kind of cope with that. So it's really refreshing, I think, for a lot of us. Maybe some of you guys have already started your season. Uh, hats off to you guys. Uh, but it's really refreshing to take the cover off of the greenhouse. You can see we're in the greenhouse right now in the backyard. Uh, this is only really a six by eight foot space. Uh, normally, throughout the winter time, we have this thing covered and that's really just to prevent, um, not necessarily any light from getting in, but to prevent um, this greenhouse from getting too cold. So the tarps and different things I've used over the years over the top of the greenhouse has really helped insulate this greenhouse. And to my right is actually a space heater that I actually have running right now. This guy runs all winter, but if you can get the, the greenhouse to stay above about 20, there's no, there's no necessity to actually run the greenhouse or to run the heater in the greenhouse. So the fig trees I have in here, in fact, I have quite a few fig trees in the ground. I have four fig trees in the ground and I have a number of potted trees that you guys can't see, but here's some branches right here. Uh, these guys definitely need to stay above about 14. You could go a little bit lower if you're really adventurous, but because a lot of them are potted, you don't want to expose the roots of the trees to too extreme of temperature. So I, I would say about 14 is really the limit. And luckily for me, although the winter was quite cold, it wasn't very extreme um, in terms of its winter low. So far, I think the lowest we may have seen is actually 10 if I'm you know, remembering correctly, but I think actually more likely the low here was about 14. So I didn't even have to run the heater really all that much, if at all. I sort of ran it as a precaution, but going forward, why I'm telling you this, is that in this environment, now that the light's coming in, this will warm up during the day, um, probably to quite an extreme temperature. I would say the difference between outside and inside is about 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, maybe even 40 if it's a really sunny day. So that's gonna really help. Maybe if it's 50 degrees outside like it'll be tomorrow and it'll be sunny all day, uh, this greenhouse will probably warm up to close to 90, which is really gonna kickstart the fig trees actually f to wake up, um, get their act together. This whole greenhouse is gonna be a jungle very soon. And then additionally, the seedlings that we're gonna start are gonna have enough heat. Now, I am gonna run this space heater here um, for probably the next two months. So if it's February, I'll probably run this thing all the way until about May or so. And that's really, the main purpose of that is to keep this greenhouse warm at night. Um, I would like to keep this greenhouse about at 45 or 50 at the minimum, if I can really help it. Um, so this greenhouse, this heater may have to run a bit you know, more overtime on certain nights than others. And what that's gonna create essentially is a pretty dry environment. So we're gonna get into that as we start our seeds here. But why that's really important is that with seedlings, you don't want them to dry out, right? So if your space heater is creating less humidity, cause that's how, you know, heaters work through science, what is that? convection or something. I, I don't remember the exact term guys, but um, it does take moisture out of the air. So it's really important, I think, uh, that when we're starting these seeds, 
is that we really need to focus on making sure that they're not drying out. And that's pretty simple, right? I mean, that's pretty basic. So what I'm gonna do actually is I have these trays this year. We really are going pretty standardized with most, kind of what most farmers would do is you have yourself 120 trays, they're called. And you guys can sort of order these. It's probably not too late. This is sort of something similar to a 120 tray where you have these very large pots that you can seed into. And this would, I guess, would technically be called an insert. What you then have with the 120 tray is like this. So this is, I got these from Greenhouse Mega Store. You can get them on Amazon. I may have a link actually in my Amazon storefront. You can see down in the description. But these are really good, these flats, because you can get them at different durability, different um, you know, thicknesses of plastic. And you can really start your seeds very easily in here. Whether you do use the tray itself is one method. And what I'm actually gonna actually be doing is using this tray to start my onions in. Um, I'm also gonna be starting probably microgreens in these, if I'm not mistaken, at some point. Um, we're gonna do a couple rounds of microgreens to see how that goes. Um, these are really nice just for filling these up with soil and having a, you know, really not the thickest amount of soil, but it's enough to really get things going. And it's so standardized that everything fits in here. So you could buy inserts sort of like this. If you wanted to have, let's say, different size pots, you could put that right inside the, the tray and that fits perfectly. And I've actually ordered very specific sized inserts for this purpose. And I, um, I don't recall the size right now and I don't have them because they're actually back ordered from Greenhouse Megastore. But what is nice is that you could also get yourself these lids and these lids go right on top of the tray and they click in nicely and then that creates a humidity dome. And by creating that humidity dome, we're essentially going to be very good at keeping our plants away from this dry air that the heater is producing. The other really important thing I want to mention, I think, is we're trying to keep a very stable environment here. And every time I come in here with a hose and I water things down, it's going to raise the humidity. Especially in a greenhouse setting like this, it's going to get trapped within this greenhouse. It's going to create condensation potentially along the, uh, the plastic here, along the sides of the greenhouse, as it slowly tries to evaporate outside the greenhouse. One way to kind of combat that and really make sure that the humidity is more regulated in here is actually the space heater. So it's, it's kind of be an interesting little fight between the humidity that the plants are producing, the humidity that I'm producing through watering these plants, whether that's with a hose or a can, let's say, and then also, you know, just this greenhouse heater actually removing some of that, um, that humidity at night. What we don't want to do is, is really have a difference in humidity that fluctuates quite drastically. If that, if that were to occur, a lot of plants that will sprout or let's say even some of these fig tree, these leaves, they get adjusted to not only the sun in this environment, but also the, the humidity in the air. So if it goes from, let's say, a very high humidity, which it probably is right now, I need to get myself a temperature and humidity gauge in here. That's one thing I uh, forgot to bring from the house, but I'll put that in here and that's gonna essentially um, tell me what the humidity is because not only is it the sunlight, uh, but the humidity as well that we need to really look at uh, because if the humidity is very high, let's say, like I said, it's, I don't know, maybe it's 60% humidity in here right now, which isn't that bad. Maybe it's roughly 50. Um, that's pretty darn good, but if we can keep it, let's say, if somehow I come in here and I water and it gets to, let's say, an 80% humidity, and as the seedlings are starting to sprout that we're going to see in just a minute, as soon as that humidity, that 80% humidity is exposed to those new leaves, um, it creates an environment, unfortunately, they sort of get used to that. 
and then if this heater is running and it drops back down to 50, well, you might have some problems, right? Because that difference, that large difference in humidity might be enough to shock the plants. So it's gonna be, I guess, one little challenge there to get this all right. Now, I have myself soil in a bin behind the uh, propagation table here that I have. And I'm just gonna very simply fill up this tray with soil. Sometimes it's nice to uh, really bang this down, press down a little bit on it. Just make sure that all the cells, this is 128 cells, so they're not very wide. It's probably about an inch by an inch. And again, it's standardized to that 120 size that, uh, that you would want. So the lids could even fit on top if I wanted to use the lids. And that's about it. We're just gonna brush off some excess soil. And I know Charles Dowding, what he likes to do is actually, he'll seed in these cells. Um, and then he will actually put another layer of soil over top. Now, one little tip here, guys, with these cells is that you might think, oh, look, they're, it's totally in the, in the cell. All that soil is in there perfect, but, but if you press down, it's really not. So I, I lightly press down here with my fingers and all of the cells just to make sure that there's enough soil in there. Because if there isn't enough soil in these already very small cells, we could kind of be shooting ourselves in the foot, right? So I'm gonna come in here, kind of tap this down. You could really, like I said, um, kind of lift it up and hit it down. And that could work too, but this is just a little bit easier for me right now. And then once that's down in there, we come in here with another layer of soil, put that over top, we'll seed into that, and then we could put another layer of soil down. And then when we're done, we put the lid on to make sure that there's just enough humidity in this, um, enough moisture, I should say, so that the soil doesn't dry out very quickly. I don't know if you guys heard that, but that was the most loudest motorcycle I think I've ever heard. Um, anyway, so that's what we're doing. All right, we got our soil in here. I'm also gonna fill up very quickly one of these trays. You know what, let's not do that right now. Let's just actually put some seeds in the soil, right? Someone's probably like, why doesn't Ross just put the seeds in the soil already, you know? Um, let's do that. Some of these cells, I'm telling you, like if you got bigger pieces in here in your soil, your cell could be unfortunately just filled with these bigger pieces and that's not good. You really wanna pay attention to your medium. So if you have a medium that's got bigger particles in it, it could be a problem for getting good germination. So really pay attention on, you know, if you have a particular cell that really doesn't look too good, usually the corners of this don't look too good. You can also really, you know, uh, what's the word? You could really thin out these bigger particles and get yourself a little bit of a, uh, a film and kind of just sift it out. There you go, that's the word. All right, so then here's our, our tray. It's 128 cells as I mentioned. What we're gonna do in this is actually a lot of sugar and snap peas. And this is one of my favorite varieties of snap pea, particularly for this area. Uh, reason being is that one, it's very tasty, but it's also very early. It says 58 days. Now, this is a shorter sugar snap pea. It doesn't climb, so I don't need a trellis. It kind of supports itself. It's very easy to grow. And, well, I think it, because it, it ripens, it produces so early in the season, it's really quite a good pea. Now these climbing peas that you might grow are, are a bit later in the season. And because of that, well, 
it might get too warm wherever you guys live. And if you don't get the plants out soon enough in the ground, the timing might be off. And you know, I would say out of all the tips I'm gonna give you guys in this video, probably the timing is one of the most important things. Getting the timing right for your crops. I could probably speed this up a little bit. Put some, put some seed on the tray. I'm doing two peas per cell. That's two peas per one inch by one inch cell. And then I'm simply moving the peas onto each cell, pressing them down. And then we're gonna come in here with more soil and cover them up. Now you could hydrate these peas as well. Some people do that. You hydrate them overnight. That'll speed up germination a bit. I don't think I really need to speed up germination because if you guys might know anything and you could maybe see outside, uh, might know anything about this area right now in the Philadelphia area, it's still snowing. Um, the snow hasn't melted yet. So I'm not really in any rush because I need to wait for the snow to melt before I can plant anything. And normally I, you know, I'll usually plant well, March 1st, today is March, uh, today is February 23rd. So we're, we're in a situation where we're a bit behind this year just because of the snow, but at the same time, I'm not really, I don't wanna be in a rush to do anything um, because again, the ground's sort of frozen. Um, I don't know if the ground's frozen, but the snow is there and that certainly creates some issues. Um, I imagine the ground might be thawed out actually beneath the, beneath the snow. Uh, one other thing I want to mention is that with these snap peas and different seeds is that some of the seeds are a bit smaller than others. And for that reason, I think I just honestly would recommend you get rid of them. Um, corn's the same way. There's a difference in size of the seed and therefore the plants are not going to be as strong. Potentially, the plants may not even produce as well. Uh, they may not produce as large of peas. And, you know, it's better to select from the right stock, right? To get yourself the right genetics. And genetics, as we've talked about so many times on this channel, is, is everything. Now, I'm doing two, two seeds in one, one cell. I don't remember the exact spacing that we do. I think we space them out maybe every four inches when we actually plant them. And I have a spreadsheet, guys, that all of you have access to down in the description. And I highly recommend that you all create something like this. So you can go to my spreadsheet down in the description and we'll go to my garden plans. And this will really label out very clearly how much of these sugar snap peas I need based off of how much land I'm gonna use. So I'll go to my garden spreadsheet garden plan spreadsheet down there at the bottom. We'll go over to the spring bed, which is all the way on the right side. You can see things like spinach, arugula, radishes, cilantro, fennel. So I have here the snap peas is roughly one, two, three, four, five. It's five feet wide in square feet because each box represents one square foot by about roughly two feet. So that means I have 10 square feet I'm gonna to dedicate to these sugar snap peas. In that 10 square feet, if really I just kind of imagine this, I could calculate it out, you know, figure out exactly how much I'm gonna plant. I don't think it's necessarily a horrible idea to overseed, um, you know, just to make sure I've got enough in the area that I want. Um, but at the same time, I imagine I probably need an entire tray. I think a tray would probably be enough for me. And that's, again, with that, that spacing that I mentioned. Um, so that's all we're doing here with the sugar snap peas. I'm gonna fill in this whole tray, but a separate tray, I should say. I'm gonna go halfway, and then I'm gonna fill in another tray halfway. Let's skip ahead to some other crops. These are beets. And we can do our beets uh, very similarly. 
in all honesty. In fact, what's interesting though about beets, I've learned is that kind of similarly to chard is that they germinate uh, multiple plants. So one seed will get you multiple plants. So you don't need to necessarily overseed your beets. However, you certainly could. Um, so let's do some of these beets, why not? Um, what I like to do and what I've learned from Charles Dowding, by the way, which I highly recommend you guys check out his channel. Um, he's a really famous market gardener in England. Um, let's see here, so the beets have a really small area. Okay, so <laughs> we're not doing that many beets this year. In fact, I actually have a ton of beets already in the ground that I need to harvest. Um, as soon as uh, I can get into the beds, I'll probably do some harvesting. But let me, um, let me plant a, just a, a row of these. Why not? And I'm going to do two of these seeds. Beets are really difficult to germinate. So I'm going to actually, I'm going to do quite a bit. I'm going to put in, I have so many of these seeds. Why not, right? I'm going to do about four seeds per. Now, what that means, though, is that I'm going to have to really do some thinning because beets, as I said, one seed turns into like, you know, three or four plants. So uh, I don't want to have, I do want to multi-sow them is what Charles Dowding does. And I think that's a really great way to grow beets, turnips, onions, a lot of crops, actually, leeks. Um, but at the same time, I don't want 20 plants in one planting, you know what I mean? Um, so I'm gonna probably thin this out maybe to four or five beets, and then I'm gonna call it a day. And we'll plant those clumps. Each clump of beet will be about four to six inches apart on center. So there's the beets. And we can label these, by the way. Um, I have myself a, a paint pen. Highly recommend it. We're gonna write on here, beets. You know, sometimes you don't recognize what they what they are when they come up. So it's it's pretty important um, if you want to plant them in the right spot. We've also got radishes. Now, some of these crops you could just direct sow them into the ground. You could have I could direct sow the the peas. I could direct sow the radishes. I could direct sow the uh, the beets. I think beets are a bit tricky, um, direct sowing them. I do like the sugar snap peas sown indoors or sown in a greenhouse. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. So we're gonna keep that the way it is. I'm not gonna sow these radishes. Um, I'm gonna direct sow them. Let's see, we got kohlrabi here. We have endive, I'll direct sow that. I think we should probably do some kohlrabi. And how much area did we dedicate to the kohlrabi? Again, just a very small area. So we'll do a row of this. The nice thing about kohlrabi and beets and turnips, well, maybe not beets. Let me see actually how many days the beets are. 56 days, okay, so that is pretty quick. And the kohlrabi's 58 days. So the fact that they're so quick, I mean, that's reasonably quick. You could plant these alongside something else like um, broccoli or cabbage or Brussels sprouts, things that are taller in the spring garden and plant these alongside them. They harvest at an earlier date, you could pull them out whenever you want. And then as soon as the broccoli and the Brussels sprouts gets large enough um, and takes up more of that space, these other crops come right out. So if you really wanna make use of your space, this is a great way to do it. Here, I'm just gonna put in about three or four seeds. It really depends on how much seed you guys have. I find that with brassicas, I almost never have a problem germinating them. I don't know why that is. 
perhaps they just germinate a bit easier. I'm also going to multi-sow these, I believe. I'll have to double check and see if that's one of the crops Charles Dowding does multi-sow. I'm just putting in a little bit of extra in here. I'm not going to get crazy. Now you can, of course, not multi-sow them and grow them in a more traditional sense. And I think if you want to grow kohlrabi, it's probably best to give them more space, actually. They need a lot of food, like most brassicas do. So if you, you multi-sow them, and if, what I mean by multi-sowing, guys, is that if you have multiple plants in the same hole, you're going to need a lot of nutrients, right? So I think actually kohlrabi is probably not a good idea to multi-sow, but we could try it. You know, what do we, what's, what's the, what's the uh, big loss here? We've got mustard. We've got some uh, more endive or chicory. We've got more mustard here. Here's some of the summer vegetables, like the Chinese broccoli. Now, what I'm gonna do in actuality is, let's do one more crop, and then I'm gonna cover it, and then I'm gonna move on. The, good, the nice thing about this time of the year, guys, is that you can really direct seed quite a bit, I find. When you direct seed at this time of the year, you know, as long as you have the temperatures, you can get yourself a, you know, a low tunnel or a cold frame, it really can increase those soil temperatures and you'll get good germination. The other nice bonus of you know, germinating in the ground right now is that there's no pests. So if you direct seed, you're really not losing out on a lot. Like things like my, you know, my uh, spinach, different lettuces, arugula, things like that. I'm not gonna even waste my time um, seeding them inside. Yeah, you can, you can get yourself maybe a little bit of time some things don't transplant transplant very well, but you know, it is what it is. Um, let's go with this crop here. This is called Piracaba. It's a type of broccoli that's really, uh, I'm really looking forward to trying it. It produces um, over a longer period of time. Instead of producing one broccoli head, it produces broccoli shoots. And hopefully you guys can see that. The camera does not want to focus because my head's there, I think. There we go. So this one, uh, let me read about it real quick. Tender long stems small, uh, sprout small sweet heads in abundance and produce more broccoli over the season than most single head varieties. So this is a variety that's gonna sit in my garden for probably all year. If I can keep it healthy and it's gonna keep producing side shoots, as long as it's gonna keep producing, I will keep it. Maybe it'll go to the summer. Maybe it'll die off in the summer and I'll have to plant something else. Oh, there's not many seed there, holy crap. Man, okay, well, let's plant some of it. Try to be very sparing with our seed. Again, I'm, I'm not gonna try to overseed in each cell, but I'm gonna have more plants than I think I probably need. And you never know what happens. Something might go wrong. Maybe you even need to do two rounds of seeding. You know, that would really stink. Maybe something goes wrong and you just need to do more seeding. The nice thing about this, these broccoli plants here, is that you only really need one plant. You don't need a lot more. Now, what I'm going to do with the broccoli, as I was sort of getting to maybe about a couple of minutes ago, was that I'm going to up pot them from these cells into larger trays, kind of like this size up here that we looked at. This is about a three inch by three inch pot. Um, those are inserts, but we're gonna put them probably in something like a one and a half to two and a half inch uh, pots. And that's gonna get them a bigger root system, bigger size, so that when we transplant them, we're gonna have more success. So I'm gonna label this. That way we know what it is when I up pot it. 
So we're going to actually, at this point here, um, after I've labeled this, we're going to make sure that we cover all of this, all the seed with another layer of soil. You can water it in really nice and neat. I think that's a really great idea. And then put over the, the cover here that I mentioned over top. If you don't have a cover like this, a really good idea is to use some plastic wrap. This is just plastic film that people use to kind of create a humidity dome. I think that really works out well over the past. I've just laid that over top. And then as soon as these things start to germinate, you take the lids off, take the plastic off. Don't give them too, much, too high of a humidity so that they can't adjust. And I'm gonna put this over here on the side for now. I'm gonna turn up the heat in here, it's getting a little cold. sun's going down here guys I'm lucky to even be out here right now um, let's take some tea okay and we're gonna do one tray for you guys really just the onions I mean it's really gonna be that simple is that we're gonna fill up an entire maybe even a half of this tray with onion seed and those will be our onion plants and in all honesty with these onions it really is a shame I couldn't do this sooner I know that the more the, the if you can give your onion plants about a two month head start before you actually plant them out it's really advantageous um, that gets them really good size and that way you can have large onions by the end of the season. Now, what I've noticed is that there's, other, there's obviously multiple ways to do it, right? So you could have onion, onion plants, as Charles Dowding does it, is he does them in cells. And he lets them actually get to a rather small size. And he believes that when you plant plants in the ground, when they're of a smaller size, they will transplant better. And that's obviously true. But onions are triggered by day length, so they bulb up at a certain time of the year based on how many hours are in the day. Also depends on the genetics of the onion, the variety of where it was adapted to. But you know, as the season goes on, and we've reached that day length, that amount of time that it takes, that, that amount of hours of sunlight it takes for these onions to then start to bulb up, uh, we want to have the largest onion at that point possible, the largest plant possible. So in order to kind of do that, one good way, one surefire way, essentially, is to plant them two months prior. Um, actually start them two months prior, I should say. And the, and the reason I should have started these a while ago I should have probably started these in January, is that if I'm gonna plant these out March 1st, like I normally would plant all these crops that we're mentioning here, plant them out March 1st, that means I need to start these seeds January 1st. We're already in February. So we're kind of behind in this sense. We're not gonna even get them to the size that I want before I plant them. Um, however, I am actually gonna plant these onions roughly around April 15th, unfortunately. And the reason for that is that I'm joining a community garden this year and these onions will be growing at that community garden. They take up too much space that I just don't have here. And uh, we will grow them there at the community garden. So in a sense, actually, I will have them started two months prior to when I'm gonna plant them. So it's not, I guess, the end of the world, is it? Um, so we're just gonna keep these guys nice, well, nice and well watered in this tray here until I'm actually gonna take them to the community garden. And uh, they're gonna grow, they're gonna get some size, and they're gonna be very dense in this tray. I'm gonna seed this out very densely. First I have to find my onion seed. Got so many seed varieties in here, guys. So as I, when I plant these, by the way, guys, I am gonna do 
the multi sew method. So again, like Charles Dowding had said, this is about one, uh, one eighth of an ounce of seed. They're called the Rosa di Milano onion. It's an Italian variety. And this is, a, I guess, an onion that would grow well here, but what I like about it is that it's a, supposed to be a very tasty onion. So I'm looking forward to this. And when I plant these out, we're gonna, like I said, multi-sow them. So in each clump of onion is going to be roughly three to five onions. And I'll space each clump about eight inches apart. Now you can obviously pull out some of the onions that are, let's say, a bit larger and harvest them maybe a bit early, or you could harvest some of the smaller ones and let the other ones get larger. Again, depends on the soil fertility that you have, depends on the amount of light that you have, but essentially what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna really just seed this in a sense that I would, let's say, a microgreen, is that I'm gonna pour out all the seed at one time. Now onion seed only lasts for one season. So it's not like I really need to be saving this for some reason. And I'm just gonna really just sprinkle this around about halfway through this. I need a lot of seed. When you do microgreens, you really need them kind of thick. Not that I'm gonna use them as microgreens, but you can really plant these onions very close and they, they like that you know I'm gonna go a little bit past the center here and then I'm gonna move these this around a little bit my hands spread the seed out just a tad And then I'm gonna do the same thing, just cover it up with more soil. That way these onion seeds will be nice and moist, have the right moisture. I have plenty of soil to grow in this tray. This tray actually has holes in it. You can get trays with and without holes. I recommend having holes for most of you. And then that's it. We put the plastic over top, let this sit again. It's gonna germinate. We're gonna have a ton of uh, onion plants here in a very small area. Now I do have another area here. So what I'm gonna do is actually do some um, broccoli sprouts. And the same exact method we're gonna use I have to find which broccoli I want to use. There was some broccoli I think I specifically wanted to use for this. It really does take up a lot of seed, unfortunately, when you do something like this. Um, that was a whole eighth of an ounce of seed. The wall from 29, I think, is the broccoli variety that I want to grow this, this season. As organized as I am, it really is taking me some time here, guys, to find this. I think I may do some cabbage as well. Uh, we might even do some kohlrabi seed, depending on how much we have, how much we need. Here's Waltham again, solstice broccoli. There's one broccoli I believe that you can grow. I think that's all I got actually. So we're not gonna get too carried away maybe. Hmm. This is 14 grams of seed. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna use this Walton 29 broccoli here. We're gonna plant this out, same way. And broccoli sprouts are extremely healthy for you. I mean, that's kind of why I'm doing this. You really want this dense. I mean, I probably want this more dense than 
than those onions. You know, I've never done microgreens before, so I'm not really the uh, expert here, guys, but we're gonna find out how this all works. I know this is pretty much how you do it. I may have to go a bit more dense, however. And we'll have to figure out when to harvest, all the different things, but it's really the same, same process. So again, I'm gonna cover this up with soil. We're gonna water this in, put the plastic on top. As soon as this germinates again, we're gonna take it off and then we're gonna call it a day. Keep it well watered, maintain the humidity in this environment and we'll be successful. Uh, I think with microgreens especially, if it's too humid, you can create mold and that's not good for your microgreens. So gotta pay attention to that guys. Alrighty everybody, I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, this was a nice little glimpse I think. I really enjoy doing this kind of video for you guys. And we'll see everybody soon, all right? Take care, everybody.